Good morning. Uh, as Dr. Godwin said, this is a special day. It's graduation day. So it's my uh, pleasure to introduce one of the two inpatient chief medical residents who are going to be giving grand rounds this year. Uh, the first to go is Dr. Collins, Dr. Lindsay Collins. And of course, she's first because I've learned that she's always first. Um, we have a tradition of going to Ray's Boathouse by bike with the chief medical residents two or three times a year. And uh, early on, there was a several people observed that John Keller was much like a chief resident from three or four years ago, Sam Ash. And wasn't what was not immediately obvious to me was that there were overlaps between Lindsay Collins and Amanda Shepard, who was the co-chief with Sam Ash. And I discovered this when we started to be on the Burt Gilman on the bicycle and Lindsay disappeared off into the horizon, leaving me and John and Jihan behind. And that was very much akin to what Amanda did when we took her to uh, race. There was only one gear and it was fast. So Dr. Collins is, is going to be giving uh, grand rounds today on the topic of sleep, but uh, this is not a woman who uh, rests quietly. It all began here uh, when she's eight months old in Virginia. She grew up in a naval family and had the good fortune of not moving around very much, uh, but she did plenty of moving around. In fact, uh, it took a great deal of work on the part of uh, her mom to get this formal photo taken. And you can see she's kind of in a sprinter's pose already. <laughs> Let me get up and get out of here. And uh, this is how I met Lindsay. She was an intern uh, here at the University of Washington <laughs> Medical Center. Not quite this uh, young, but she was, uh, she was ready to go. And the first day that I met her, I said, well, can we, uh, can we get started on rounds? And she said, giddy up, let's go. And off we went. Uh, as I mentioned, she grew up in, in Virginia, but she visited the Northwest very early. Here she is at three, and she managed to hook a 14-inch uh, trout from one of the local waters. And her screams of joy could be heard up and down the coast. And she said, I got a fish, I got a fish, I got a fish. And this was uh, the first of her many forays into the outdoors. She's quite active. Uh, here you can see her at age three. Uh, she's an accomplished ballerina. But she, <laughs> we can turn off your mic now, Lindsay. <laughs> this may be the last time you see her in a tutu. Uh, there's, there's one other attribute about uh, Lindsay that I want to point out. Uh, and that is that she is an incredibly tough competitor. So far you've seen her with her trademark smile in each and every photo. Uh, but she went to Yale University where she was on the field or the lacrosse team. No. She was all Ivy, all American, academic American. And here she is on the field, no smile. Let's go. Let's make it. Uh, so she was a terrific uh, lacrosse player. The other attribute about her is that she has a way with animals. Uh, you've heard of the, the dog whisperer. Here she is as the giraffe whisperer and enjoying the fruits of her labor. Uh, she loves to hike, so we're going to talk a little bit more about animals and hiking and so forth. Uh, but here's a picture of her and her three friends hiking around the Pacific Northwest. And for the life of me, it looks to me like they're all trying to emulate the camel. Uh, here's the first actually puckering up, the second getting the, the tongue ready, and the third actually laughing. So, uh, but she enjoys very much hiking, backpacking. She cycled across the United States, raising money for Habitat for Humanity in her uh, senior year at Yale. And then she went on to Virginia Commonwealth University, a medical school, where she was selected the top student. And then we had the good fortune of having her come here for residency. Uh, this is a story about an ill-fated goat who met uh, Lindsay on the trail last year. She was hiking with a collection of her friends and this fierce mountain goat greeted them on the path. There was a stare down and Lindsay decided two things. One, she could outrun the goat. And two, she somehow had a recollection that goats can't swim, which turns out to be erroneous. Uh, but she was able to run and swim faster than this goat. And much like me, the goat in a close up walked away dejected. Uh, this is our esteemed uh, chief medical residents together in one of their serious moments at the prom. Uh, the mustachioed person on the, the your left here is Dr. Keller, if you can't recognize him. And I, I want to end actually with one last photo and then a couple of additional comments. But uh, 
there's one very lucky man here in the audience. This is Calvin, uh, who has been her steady blow for the last few years. Uh, so he, he's a very fortunate man to have Lindsay in his life. Uh, and I want to pause and just thank Lindsay a great deal. She's been a wonderful leader, teacher, and for me, a friend this year. I've enjoyed her enormously. I love her ebullience, her enthusiasm, and her uh, joy uh, and spirits about everything in her life. Um, I want to comment as she comes to the podium. This is the first day that I've seen her at 8 o'clock in the morning without her biker clothes on. So uh, thank you for dressing up, Dr. Collins. All right, nice warm hand of applause for Dr. Collins. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Brad, for that more than generous and uh, not too embarrassing introduction. That was indeed my peak of my ballet career, if anyone was wondering. Um, all right, so today I'm gonna talk to you guys about the metabolic effects of sleep deprivation in a talk titled Sleepless in Seattle. Unfortunately, I have no disclosures. And today we're gonna try and, I'm gonna talk about three main aspects of these connections. We're gonna talk about the epidemic of sleep deprivation in America, the pathologic effects of chronic sleep deprivation, and the metabolic outcomes of sleep deprivation. And first, we're gonna drop back and get a little historical perspective. Um, and we're gonna go all the way back to our founding father, Ben Franklin. And as many of you know him as inventing many things, he also wrote Poor Richard's Almanac, in which I think he laid the foundation for how our culture thinks about sleep. When he said, up sluggard and waste not life, in the grave will be sleeping enough. And this is a phrase that has been perpetuated throughout our years as a, as a culture in America and has been bastardized to what many of us now know as you can sleep when you're dead. And I think many people, rarely do children go through their childhood years and not have heard this phrase. So he kind of laid that foundation for us. And then came Thomas Edison. And not even 100 years later, he was continuing to perpetuate this culture of sleep, um, kind of hatred for sleep, as he was notorious for his dislike for sleep. So much so that he felt the future man will spend less time in bed. And a million years from now, man won't go to bed at all. And perfectly, he invented the light bulb. <laughs> in an effort to try and destroy sleep once and for all. <laughs> However, I think it's interesting as we kind of think about what our forefathers and our past people have done. Let's get an idea of how much we sleep. And so I ask you guys to vote now. Um, you guys, anyone who has a clicker. And let's get an idea of how much we as an audience actually are sleeping. Okay. All right, I think I have enough answers. Wow, all right. We're actually doing pretty well, guys. <laughs> so most of us are sleeping about seven hours and kind of right down to about six hours. So everyone's sleeping about six to seven hours. We're doing really good staying away from the five hours. All right, and, and a similar question. How many hours do you guys think the average American <coughs> on a weeknight is sleeping? All right, all right, kind of more of a 50-50 split here. So you guys are on the right track. The average American is sleeping seven hours a night, so kudos to you guys that are getting there. And I think this is interesting. And so let's step back a little bit into the 1960s as we're looking at our data to support this. And so we're back into the Kennedy era, right? So this is the first big study that was done for looking at how do Americans sleep? What is our average sleep? And they found that the modal sleep duration was eight to 8.9 hours per night, which is quite a bit. And as we just saw, average Americans now are sleeping closer to seven. 
So how did this trend develop? Why do we decrease? So Gallup poll has done a little bit more um, frequent studying than the other study, and they looked at how they uh, they looked at how Americans are sleeping less, and they asked people over several years, usually, how many hours of sleep do you get at night? And so if we look at 1990 as our first benchmark on this graph or chart, we can see that even by 1990, our average sleep had already decreased to 6.7 hours a night, which is quite depressed from where we were just in the 1960s. And if you look, in the, look at the chart, it actually seems most of the distribution change occurred from most of the people in 1942. Two were sleeping eight hours a night, and very few people were sleeping less than seven. However, by even by 1990, over 40% of people are sleeping less than seven hours a night. And this has perpetuated through 2013, where the most recent data is from. And I think it's interesting that our sleep isn't getting worse as a society, as a culture, but we're actually not getting better. And so I think this brings up the question, have we just become complacent with our sleep debt? And looking at a larger study, because Gallup polls are only about 1,000 people, so maybe we have some sampling error, and maybe this isn't quite representative. But the CDC has done a similar study, and they looked at 23,000 people, and this is all self-reported sleep. And they looked at how people are sleeping in 1985 versus 2006, as that's the most recent CDC data. And they just asked, are you sleeping more or less than, seven, than six hours a night? So they actually dichotomized it lower. They hit a lower bar, and they still found that 30% of both men and women in 2006 are sleeping less than six hours and less than six hours a night, which is really impressive given um, given what the average is that we're seeing. And so, just a really sharp decline has happened in the last fifty years. And so, what is the correct amount of sleep? So, in two thousand and fifteen, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine got together and tried to help practitioners and lay people understand what should, what is the amount of sleep that we should be getting. And they issued a consensus statement that recommends 18 to, 20, to 65 year olds sleep at least seven hours a night to promote optimal health and well-being. And this again is a population level kind of recommendation. And then they broke it down a little further. And they looked at, because young people actually need, might need more sleep. And so, they looked at the 18 to 25 year olds as a little bit of a subset population. And they said, not everyone's the same. And we need to treat some groups and even some individuals more specifically and more individually. And so they recommended, they said that these people, the 18 to 25 year olds, actually might do better with 10 to 11 hours of sleep. And that the seven to nine may not even be enough for them. And so I think with this idea, understanding that some people may need more than even this recommendation, but that anything less than six is really inappropriate. And so in summary, what they advised us is that sleeping six or fewer hours per night is inadequate, and that seven or more hours per, of sleep per night is recommended for adults, and that a third of our population is not getting enough sleep. So, when we think about sleep, it's not, we understand that, okay, we're not hitting the recommendation. We're sleeping less than what we think we probably should be. But why, why do we need that much sleep? What are the, let's transition into the talk talking about, the next part of the talk talking about the pathologic effects of sleep depth. And I'm going to start with the effect of sleep deprivation on cognition. And so let's first look at concentration and how it's impaired with acute sleep deprivation before we transition into talking a little more about chronic sleep deprivation with it. And so this is a study that looked at concentration over when people were staying awake for 28 hours. And they had them assess over this time period on a computer-based um, concentration test. And you can see that the test scores go down complete linearly with how many hours the people are awake. And then they had another arm in which they gave another group of people that in 
instead, they had them drink alcohol every 30 minutes. And they assessed them on the exact same sleep um, computerized or concentration test on the computer. And you can see it has still an impressive um, de linear decrease as you became progressively more drunk. And these two spots represent the same score on the concentration test for when someone becomes legally drunk at 0.08 happens to correlate with when you've been awake for 22 hours. So to put that another way, when we've been awake for, 24, for 22 hours, our concentration is, on this test is the equivalent of when you're legally drunk. And so we know we have some issues with, with acute sleep deprivation and concentration. But how does this translate to our chronic sleep debt? And so this is a similar um, test in terms of the computer concentration exam. And they looked at four different arms. They looked at a group that is spending no time in bed for a couple days. And then they looked at three groups over two weeks, one that was spending four hours each night in bed, six hours, and then eight hours in bed. And they were looking at how they were doing over this time period on their computer, um, on the concentration test, and seeing how many errors they made. And you can see in the black line, this is the one people that spent no time in bed um, for a couple of days. And as we would all expect, they make a lot of errors really quick. So their slope is very steep. But I think, interestingly, the people who spent four hours in bed every night for two weeks actually reached the exact same error rate by the end of the two weeks. So, which is really interesting, because I think we don't think about that cumulative effect as often. Similarly, the people who were sleeping six hours, which was, I believe, about 30% of us, if you sleep six hours every night, then you also are kind of slowly accumulating your sleep debt, which has concentrate makes you, which is correlating to concentration errors in this study. And this line doesn't quite reach the same level that the people who were making the same error rate that the people who were sleeping no time in bed for a couple days. But you could imagine if we continue the study longer, it also might reach that rate. And then interestingly, the eight, people who were sleeping eight hours, which is above the sleep consensus recommendations, actually started making some errors too. And I think this probably speaks to the fact that these recommendations are at a population level and everyone's individual. And so you can't, so some people probably need more than eight hours. And so they were actually accumulating a little bit of sleep debt as well. But the take home point from this slide is that your concentration, you can, it seems to be, your sleep debt seems to be accumulating over time. That does lead to tangible concentration changes and an error rate that can be similar with even more condensed acute sleep deprivation. Okay, but that was a computer test. And I don't really care as much how I do on a computer test in terms of my concentration. How does, this how does this translate to my life? And so the CDC looked at this, and they found that in over a, a group of a large population that surveyed it all at every single age level for adults, that over 30% of people were falling asleep unintentionally at least once during the last month. And I think all of us are sitting here going, yeah, I kind of fall asleep on my couch sometimes, okay. But that wasn't always when it was happening. Between 2 and 7% of people fall asleep behind the wheel at least once a month. And that actually is a major factor, as the Department of Transportation actually notes that over 1,500 fatalities and car accidents are due to drowsy driving a year. And so this has a major public health outcome. Okay, so concentration is impaired in sleep deprivation, even in the chronic state. I think we can all, like, that's not too much of a stretch that many of us think about on a regular basis. But what about other diseases? What about other pathologies that are correlated to sleep death? And so these are six of the, of the major pathologies that are, have been frequently correlated with sleep deprivation and increasing prevalences. And I think all of us see these every day in our clinic. These are major morbidities. These, all these pathologies have major morbidity and mortality for our country as a whole and for our individual patients. For today, though, I'm going to focus on four. I'm going to focus on early death, hypertension, obesity, 
and diabetes, um, as these are all four major components of things that have been correlated with the metabolic syndrome. And as we're going to start talking about metabolic outcomes, we're going to focus on these. So first, let's talk about how mortality increases with sleep death. Now, this is a large meta-analysis. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, large meta-analysis, looking at how mortality correlates with sleep duration. And this is an impressive U-shaped curve. I will say that we don't, many researchers don't know what to make of this upper arm. And the reason is, is they think there's a, a lot of cause behind this is actually due to undiagnosed um, illnesses, things that have not been recognized yet. And so we're not going to focus on that. We're going to focus on this lower half. And I know it's less dramatic, but it's still impressive as there's a relative risk increase with each um, decreased hour of sleep below seven. And yes, it's more subtle, but I think it's important. And especially considering there seems to be a dose effect that we're seeing here with each hour we decrease, we're having more and more mortality. And so the question for me then is, why are we having this? Why are we seeing an increase in mortality with just decreasing sleep? And so we'll try and answer that as we talk, give you several, um, talk about the other pathologies, hypertension, diabetes, and obesity for the rest of the talk to maybe give you a link that could be considered. And so let's first talk about hypertension. And we'll focus first on how systolic blood pressure is increased with sleep deprivation. And so this is a five-year longitudinal study. And it has over 500 people in it. And it asked people, beginning the study and then throughout the study, how much they're sleeping. So it's self-reported. And it looked at the changes of the systolic blood pressure from their baseline when they recruited in the beginning of the study. And so as you can see here, kind of going from six to seven hours down to less than four hours, we again see this dose effect of how each decreased hour of sleep leads to increases in our blood pressure. And I think it's interesting in seeing this change and how it's correlating. Again, I think the greater than seven hours might be that effect that we're not sure, that because there is some increase there, that we're not sure if everyone has the same amount of need for sleep. And we might be seeing some people still needing more sleep than what we're allowing them in this study. But I think as clinicians, I, yes, we all watch changes in blood pressure, but our big question is, is this actually clinically important? And does this actually correlate to increases in hypertension and prevalence? And so another study looks at that. And they found that sleep deprivation increases the prevalence of hypertension. And so this is a little bit of a different design. This is about 6,000 people who self-reported their sleep again. And they asked them just simply, when they came into the study, is do you have, do you have a diagnosis of hypertension? Or do you have antihypertensive, or do you take antihypertensives? And if they didn't, they then took their blood pressure on several different occasions. And what they found is that as you decrease below seven hours of sleep, you again see a dose effect in increases in prevalence in hypertension, um, which was statistically significant for each hour decreased. And so knowing that we have a correlation between sleep deprivation and hypertension, and I want to transition to talking about obesity and sleep depth. <laughs> And so let's first look at BMI, kind of again as a parameter that we all use in trying to assess as our patients are, how our patients are doing in terms of obesity. And so this is another, eight, it's an eight year longitudinal study. And it's a large study of about 7,000 people. And it looked at the change of BMI from baseline. And it found that the BMI statistically increases with sleep deprivation. As you look at your sleep duration on the X axis, and it's seven through nine hours, there's really no effect. And the second you drop below seven hours, looking at six, five, and less, there's a steady rise and a dose effect again of increases in BMI during the study. And so I think this just, add, this just supports the idea that BMI is increasing as, our, as we're getting more sleep deprived. But BMI is one thing. But just like blood pressure and hypertension, we actually really care, are we getting more obese? And so this is a very large meta-analysis that found that obesity is more prevalent in sleep deprivation. And they looked at over 23 studies of adults with over 600,000 people. 
And they all had different measures for sleep deprivation and where they made their cutoff. But importantly, they're all less than seven. So we're sticking to below what our American consensus for sleep statement recommendation is. And they still found that the odds ratio, the pool odds ratio is 1.55. So this impressive increase in odds for obesity in correlation with decreased sleep is impressive. And I think that just makes a high link to obesity being increased prevalence with um, sleep duration, sleep deprivation. And it asks more questions, I think, for the US. So we have this high prevalence. But where are these people? Are we equally distributed across the US? Or is it more of a geographic, um, more geographic certain predisposition? And so during the CDC looked at this and they asked people during the past 30 days, how many days have you felt you did not get enough sleep? And so the dark blue and the dark blues are the people who slept less, whereas white is people who slept more. Don't worry, Washington, we actually did pretty well. Um, but interestingly, this map looks really similar to the US obesity prevalence map from 2014. And so again, the darker colors are higher um, prevalence of obesity. And so here they are next to each other. And I think it's not a far stretch to say the darker colors are the, in both maps are people who sleep less and are more obese, whereas the lighter <coughs> colors are people that are leaner and are sleeping more. And so we have a connection between obesity and um, sleep deprivation. But what is this link? And so I'm going to spend the remainder of the talk looking at how are there hormonal imbalances that in our metabolic pathways that may be providing this link between sleep and these pathologies. So we're going to walk through this chart and we're going to look at how to connect sleep deprivation with obesity and type 2 diabetes. And there's many different pathways to look at. I've chosen these because I think they're in the most interesting. And we obviously have some behavioral components as well as biological, as with many things in medicine. But we're not going to talk about the behavioral pathways today. We're going to focus on our biological. And first, and we're going to park down both of these arms. And first, we're going to focus here. And we're going to look at how increases in growth hormone and evening cortisol lead to increase in insulin resistance and ultimately lead to an increased prevalence of diabetes mellitus. And so let's start with cortisol. This is a normal cortisol circadian rhythm. We all think about this only when we're looking at adrenal insufficiency. But as a reminder, you start elevated at 8 a.m. and it falls throughout the day. And as a sleep, steep slope in the early afternoon for at night or at night, and then it goes back up at 8, by 8 a.m. the next morning. But I want you to actually focus here on a spot we never think about. And it's this early evening or late afternoon cortisol that kind of falls off as we're all driving home from work, kind of starting to eat dinner. It just drops off so that it can reach its nadir at night. And I want you to think about it because that's what changes. And so when people are sleep deprived, they actually have a persistent elevation of that evening cortisol, which is here. And so it maintains much of its circadian pattern, but it has this it doesn't fall off in the early afternoon like it does when it's in a normal state. And so this is a four-hour study, but this has actually been replicated in studies with as much sleep as just less than seven hours. And so the elevations in cortisol are kind of persistent in the afternoon. It's also been looked at chronically, and it's been found that this actually stays with you over time if you continue to have sleep debt and doesn't really reset or like kind of go back to its normal. But you continue to have this elevation in the evening, early evening and late afternoon of your cortisol. And so I think it's, we got to think about why we care about elevated cortisol. And we don't know that all the consequences that we associate with elevated cortisol <laughs> are associated with sleep debt. But I think it's interesting knowing this elevation, what, let's review kind of what happens. And so all of us actually know elevated cortisol by a much more common name of Cushing syndrome. And so thinking about what happens with that, we get hyperglycemia due to insulin resistance, hypertension, dyslipidemia, 
and chunkal obesity. All things that we are talking about here that are correlating with sleep depth. Interestingly, the other thing we get is hypogonadism. And as a kind of fun aside, people, the, a study was looked at in post-call residents. Looking at, well, I know many of you guys were thinking it already, but does this happen to me if I'm a resident overnight? How do all these changes happen? And so they looked at not only your cortisol, um, but they looked at seeing it elevated in the early afternoon. And this is 42 OB residents who came back from vacation and got a test and then came back from post-call and got a test. And so they had a significant elevation in their cortisol. But then they asked the next question of, okay, if we have elevated cortisol, do we have any of these known consequences that are associated with Cushing syndrome? And yes, you do. And so they found <laughs> that low testosterone is present in post-call residents in a statistically significant way the morning following post-call as compared to the morning when you come back from vacation. So just a fun fact, but it's good to know what staying awake for 24 hours will do to you. <laughs> so now we're going to transition back to talking about growth hormone. And for those that don't know, this is the Princess Bride and uh, Andre the Giant. And I show you this because we're going to look at some growth hormone changes that hormonally are actually very similar to those that we see in acromegaly. And so growth hormone has a, has a, this is the normal growth hormone circadian pathway. It's very low throughout the day and then has a sharp rise right as you go to sleep. The box, sorry, is sleep. And so it sharply rises and is heavily correlated with sleep. It's really not that tied to a circadian rhythm. It's much closer tied to actually sleep. And so when you don't sleep and you stay awake for 24 hours, you lose that rise and you have more of just a subtle elevation of your baseline throughout the day. And so now let me just show you a little bit about what acromegaly looks like. So this is a normal on your right. And again, it has some going to sleep and you see really low levels during the day. They go to sleep and they start getting spikes. And this multiple spikes is actually equivalent to the singular spike on the previous graph. So it's just simplified. And so Again, just really low levels. And then you compare it to acromegaly, and there's just a baseline elevation. You lose the spike, but it's just elevated throughout the day. And so when we put that next to what our plot looks like in sleep deprivation, you can see that it actually looks much more similar to the growth hormone changes of acromegaly than in a normal person. And you lose that spike in both. And there's just a subtle elevation of, of growth hormone in both states. And so I'm not suggesting that people who are sleep deprived will develop acromegalic phenotypes. But I think it's interesting to think about the me other metabolic consequences that may be more subtle and associated with this elevation in growth hormone. And so those include hypertension, diabetes, and decrease in lean body mass. Again, all things that we're associating at this point and have been shown to have increased prevalences in the sleep deprived state. So we're going to come back here. And we've talked about increased growth hormone and an increase in even cortisol. And now I want to transition to talking about increases in insulin resistance, leading to increased prevalence of type 2 diabetes. Okay. So this is four different studies that all showed that there's a decrease in insulin sensitivity with sleep debt. And so they all looked at about four to 14 nights of sleep deprivation. And then at the end of the study, assessed their insulin sensitivity with a glucose metabolism assessment using a glucose strip. And these were all normal people at the start of the study in terms of their baseline insulin sensitivity was normal. And after going through anywhere from less than six hours of sleep, they all increased their insulin, or all of their insulin sensitivities decreased by 16 to 24%. This doesn't actually show a dose, a dose effect that is seen in many of the other things we've looked at, but I think it's still powerful that such a profound decrease in insulin sensitivity 
is correlated over and over with sleep deprivation. And so we think about insulin sensitivity actually not uncommonly as clinicians, as this is a, a precursor to type 2 diabetes and concern for people developing this. And so this led to the question that many have asked is and answered that there is an increased prevalence of diabetes mellitus with sleep deprivation. And so this is a meta-analysis of nine of the many studies that have been done um, to try and answer this question. And they looked at, and they all found looking at less than seven hours of sleep was increased prevalence of diabetes and that the odds ratio is 1.28, which is pretty impressive. And so again, there's no real dose effect here, but I think the increased prevalence in itself is interesting. And so now we're gonna move from talking about diabetes <coughs> and move over to talking about our hunger pathway. And we're gonna talk about hormones with leptin and ghrelin and how they affect our appetite and our increased food intake, leading to obesity and weight gain. And no one's more hungry than Cookie Monster. So what are ghrelin and leptin? I think these are two of the newer kids on the block in terms of hormones, and not all of us learned a lot about them in medical school. And they are complicated, being honest. They have a lot of biological mm -hmm. mechanisms. They do many things. But I don't want you to think about any of those. I just want you to think about ghrelin as your hunger hormone. And when the stomach gets empty, it really wants food. So it shoots off a lot of ghrelin. And it goes to the hypothalamus that releases a bunch of neuropeptides. And it tells our body to eat. In contrast, leptin is our satiety hormone. And it, when the stomach gets full, ghrelin decreases and leptin's released um, from the stomach and the adipose tissue. And it goes up to your hypothalamus and shoots off a bunch of neuropeptides that say, stop eating. So ghrelin, hunger, leptin, satiety. And so let's look at the different circadian pathway patterns with these. And so let's look at leptin first. Leptin has a normal steady rise throughout the day with peaks in early sleep. It's not associated at all really with meals, which we would expect because it's more associated with satiety. And it is mostly released by adipose tissue, which is constantly there. But ghrelin is different. Ghrelin is more acutely associated and connected with meal times, And that makes sense because it's our hunger hormone. And so ghrelin also, interestingly, though, has this decrease over the night despite a fasting state, which you would think you would get hungry. And so what happens in sleep deprivation? Leptin actually decreases pretty profoundly with sleep deprivation. So looking at this, they had a 19% lower mean leptin levels in sleep debt. And the peak levels actually occurred two hours earlier and are 26% lower in a sleep debt state. And these studies were all done over about a week. And then what about ghrelin? What about its counterpart? So ghrelin actually increases about 15% with sleep dead. This is in a study of about 1,000 people looking at AM plasma ghrelin levels in self-reported sleep duration. And as people drop from 8 down to 5, it has a linear increase um, up to 15%. And so what about in a single day? I think all of us have this experience more in like a single day time period. You're like, yeah, I didn't sleep well for one night, and I was starving and so hungry. So what happens in one night of sleep? And so ghrelin here is elevated as you step from seven to four and a half and down to no sleep. And it's a trend that is almost a, do that is a dose effect. And looking at your plasma AM levels of ghrelin. So ghrelin is increased with sleep deprivation. Or sorry, yeah, increased. But there's no difference in leptin levels. And so this is just one night which actually kind of makes sense because it's more of a constant, it's a satiety hormone that's released by your adipose tissue more than even your stomach. And that would make sense that it's not changing as acutely um, in terms of over just one night. But hunger in their assessment using images is significantly increased at each step. So even dropping down to four and a half hours of sleep, 
your hunger levels increase significantly, and obviously even more significantly as you drop down to no sleep for the night. And so this was a small study, but I think interesting. And so another group repeated this with, much, with a much larger study and looked at, okay, since leptin doesn't change that much in one night, is this really a ghrelin to leptin ratio problem? And is it a ghrelin to leptin ratio elevation that leads to more hunger? And so they looked and they found that this ratio indeed, even over a week's time, is, continues to be elevated at four hours sleep deprivation repeatedly as compared to 10 hours. And then they showed these people images of, of foods and had them rate how hungry they were. And in fact, the people with a higher ghrelin to leptin ratio and less sleep were indeed quite a bit more hungry. And so I think looking at ghrelin and leptin, the conclusions that we know are that sleep deprivation disrupts the circadian path, the rhythms of both these hormones. And the increasing ghrelin to leptin ratio correlates with increased hunger, or increased hunger. But does this increase in hunger lead to increased food intake? And a group looked at this, and in fact it does. And so this is a study of about 200 people, and they had half of them sleep eight hours and half of them sleep four and a half hours a night for about a week. And then they asked them throughout the study, and at the end, how like looked at how many calories they actually ate. And so it was all done in a lab. And the people who slept eight hours had about 100% of their daily caloric needs as kind of calculated by their body weight. But the people that slept four and a half hours a night ate 130% of their daily caloric needs, which is well above your metabolic requirement for just for staying awake for an extra three and a half hours. And so I think all of us kind of know this. We're like, yeah, I snack more at night. But this is an impressive caloric increase. And so it leads to the question of what kinds of calories are we eating when we're up? And so this is a study that looked at, that showed that there's an increased desire for high calorie foods when you're sleep deprived. And so what they did is they took a sleep deprived group and people were sleeping normal. And then they showed them at the end of the study, a bunch of images of pictures. And not surprisingly, not that many people wanted the carrots. <laughs> but oh, did many people want the potato chips that have been sleep deprived. And so there's, we kind of all know this. No one wants the carrots when they're up at 3 a.m. Everyone wants the potato chips, popcorn. But I think it's interesting to see this actually have port, uh, been shown out in a study. And that it's actually a pretty significant difference. And maybe accounting for the majority of those 30% extra calories. And so looking back at our chart, we've looked at kind of the biological pathways and how changes and imbalances in these hormones lead to, can lead to type 2 diabetes, increased prevalence, as well as an increased prevalence in obesity. And we also started touching on something that there's probably some more crossover. As we were looking at these last studies, there seems to be more of maybe a biological background to some of these behavioral pathways too. So I don't think it's also cut and dry. And I think there's many, there's a lot of foundation for many more studies to come in the future. But I think that we'll see many more crossovers as the more we know between these biological and behavioral pathways. And so in summary, what I hope I've convinced you of is that there is a sleep debt epidemic in America. And that this has been correlated with poor health outcomes, specifically related to obesity and the metabolic syndrome and adverse changes occur to metabolic hormone levels with sleep debt that may predispose people to this increased prevalence of diabetes and obesity. And so in conclusion, as we're all seeing our patients in our clinics, and we all have many patients that have hypertension, diabetes, and obesity, and they're always asking us what they can do to kind of try and make a difference. And we always talk about the lifestyle changes of exercising more, eating better. And I would argue we should also be telling them that they should sleep more. And so with that, thank you. I'd like to give a few acknowledgements. Thank you, Brad, um, for all your help, not only on this presentation, but throughout the year. 
as well as to Ken and Bill for their unending guidance, and to Ursula and the office of the chair, to Kelly Corning and the residency office, without whom I know I would have been completely lost all year, to my co-chiefs and specifically my counterparts, John and Jihan here at the U, and to the house staff for which you are a pleasure to have worked with, and to my family and friends for their ever-ending support. And with that, I'll take a few questions. <laughs>